Um, and so we're really excited to have today's conversation. Um, it's going to be a fascinating talk about the struggle between Confucianism, the philosophy that's defined Chinese culture for thousands of years, and communism, which has waxed and waning during the reform period of the last 40 years. Um, as you all know, during China's Cultural Revolution, Mao's Red Guards denounced Confucius for fostering bad elements, rightists, monsters, and freaks. But then after that turbulent decade, uh, the Communist Party embraced capitalist style reforms and oddly enough, turned to Confucius to fill a gaping ideological vacuum. Now, General pa Party General Secretary Xi Jinping, who seems determined to both maintain stability and develop a more equitable society, once again is promoting stern communist rhetoric and values. So the question is, will China eventually find a way to integrate these two uh, traditions? And what can the struggle between communism and Confucianism tell us about China's future path? This afternoon, we're really delighted to host Confucian scholar Daniel Bell, who, is, who as dean of the School of Political Science and Public Administration at Shandong University, has an insider's view of these philosophical struggles. Um, Professor Bell's writings about Chinese meritocracy, sometimes arguing that uh, the China's political system works better than ours here, um, have been highly controversial. No. <laughs> He's held many academic positions, and his books include the Dean of Shandong, his newest, newest, uh, newest book, Just Hierarchy, The China Model, The Spirit of Cities, China's New Confucianism, and Beyond Liberal Democracy. Professor Bell is going to talk for about 20 minutes, uh, and then Professors Peter Boll and Wen Yu will share their thoughts and convene a conversation. <laughs> And we'll have time for questions at the end of um, of these these talks. So please start thinking about what you'd like to ask. Uh, Professor Bowl is the Charles H. Carswell Carswell Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations, and one of the great experts on ancient Chinese philosophy and Confucianism. He's the author of This Culture of Ours: Intellectual Transitions in Tang and Song China, Neo Confucianism in History and a number of other books and publications. And Wen Yu is a visiting assistant professor at Boston College who received her PhD in history here at Harvard. Um, her research focuses on China's social and political thought and intellectual culture. And she's currently writing a book about the search for a Chinese way uh, in the modern world, which grapples with many of the questions that we'll be talking about today. So we're absolutely thrilled to have all three experts today. And um, I just wanna give one quick plug before I hand the microphone over that next um, Thursday at our Critical Issues Confronting China series, we're gonna have economist Yao Yang uh, speaking about correcting some of the dire consequences, what he calls the dire consequences of 40 years of reform. So it's gonna be a very, very interesting talk. Please come to that as well. So um, with no further ado, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Professor Belk. Thank you. I'll set my alarm, but feel free to use uh, legalist methods to come on. Um, so, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Inda, for the invitation, and, and thank you for my uh, for the other panelists who will provide much more, frankly, uh, historically informed and academically in depth analysis than I will. Um, so this talk will draw mainly on, on this book, a couple of chapters in this book, which is an account of my experience serving as dean. But I only talk about my own experience if it sheds light on uh, academia in China and the political system. And today, I talk mainly about the uh, Confucian and communist uh, aspect, because I was hired for this job by, his name is Kong Shuji. He's a party secretary of the campus at Qingdao, the new campus. And he he's a 76th generation descendant of Hongzi, or, and, and, he's, uh, and he's very proud of the tradition. And he thought that I could help to promote Confucian uh, tradition um, at Shandong University. And as you probably know, Shandong is basically the home ground of Confucianism. Um, but it wasn't very successful, frankly. So this record, this book is more of a record of my 
uh, not well, not fail. Well, okay, failure. Um, and but I think we draw some kind of interest, interesting lessons from failure as well. One of the key aspects, and here just because we, I met some uh, graduate students earlier talking about political meritocracy, and I had an earlier book on political meritocracy, and I, I described in one of the chapters what are the key uh, characteristics of successful public officials, and and I I said there were three. One is above average analytical ability, because at higher levels of government, it's very, the issues are very complex. And two is um, above average EQ, because you have to deal with people and persuade people and know how to work with people. And three is virtue, meaning at least you have to be partly committed to serving other people as opposed to yourself or your family. But what I discovered, and I didn't write this in this earlier book, and this is my biggest failure, is the most important characteristic of all to be a successful public official is not none of these three. It's the ability to work hard, stamina. And then I looked at some of the previous great Confucian officials in the past, and that was really what they had, almost more than anything else. If you are a public official in China, we can criticize them, but what a work ethic they had. Constantly on call, no weekends. And during COVID times, the party secretaries and the vice deans lived on campus full time, dealing with this problem, serving other people, worrying about the unemployment of students. Um, and it's very honorable. And the meetings would last hours, like four hours sometimes, to deal with issues. And it was very serious deliberations. You know, we, I, that's why so long as there's some form of collective leadership at the top in China, I'm still a little bit uh, hopeful, or, or at least not that pessimistic. I mean, um, but I didn't have that stamina. I basically, you know, lost the ability to concentrate after about an hour. Um, <laughs> and that helps to explain why I wasn't successful, frankly, um, as dean. But let me move on to the um, to the topic here. Um, so the, the okay, go like this. Okay, so the, the book is actually written. I don't know why it's very heavy matter bureaucracy, Confucianism, communism, but it's written in a very with a very light touch. Um, and even the harshest critics, like Gordon Chang, you probably know him. He wrote a book called "The Coming Collapse of China." He wrote that about, I think, 20 years ago. We're still waiting. Um, but he he, he wrote a, a piece, uh, critique called it, Confucian of a China Apologist, something like that. But even he, reckon, sorry, I shouldn't say it. Even he said that the book is uh, entertaining. So this is a lovely um, cover um, with emojis. And each emoji represents a theme of the book. And originally, I had used a, a doll, uh, which is a to, to a kind of AI to program. And then, but my editor at Princeton rejected it. He's saying, "Luckily, we still have human graphic designers." And they came up with this beautiful uh, cover. So, judging by the cover, it's a brilliant book. I'm not responsible for it, and I won't comment on the content. But at least I can be proud to say that. By the way, my my father. I'm sorry, I'm drifting. Final footnote: He was a writer who turned a secondhand bookseller, um, and at the end of his life. And then he, he said, you know, what I really learned is we have to judge a book by its cover. So <laughs> on those grounds, I'm very proud. Of okay, now let me go into the subject material here. So in the 1980s, those of you, I mean, most of you are probably too young to remember this, um, but um, most Chinese intellectuals and uh, political reformers had a view that China's future is basically liberal democratic modernity, meaning in its kind of economic form, a kind of capitalist uh, or form of organization, and politically a kind of democracy. And the US was viewed as the model, um, typically, by students uh, and intellectuals. And many of the talented students in those days, they didn't want to join the Communist Party because, first of all, they weren't inspired by communism anyway. And secondly, it wasn't viewed as, as, as the road to success. Um, <clears throat> And both Confucianism and communism were basically dead as motivating forces among the intellectuals and political reformers. Very few appealed to Confucianism and communism as, as a kind of inspiration. So now I'm, I'm really thinking, what are the political ideals that inspire people? I think it's a hugely important topic. And that's why the language of China and authoritarianism, I just, it's, I mean, yes, but what does that mean exactly? I, many there's still many intellectuals and students who who seek inspiration from uh, political ideals. And what are those political ideals? Well, two of them have made a huge comeback in the 1990s. I mean, we can uh, talk about why. I will talk about why in a second. Um, but at least what's quite fascinating. Sometimes I'm like, oh, you've been in China so so long. What has been the major change? 
I, I mean, it's so complicated question, but at least if I have to reduce it in one slogan, it's the comeback of history and tradition. And in the case of political ideals, it's the comeback of the Confucian and Marxist traditions. And both traditions have, not, have, have, have had huge and unexpected comebacks. There's almost a consensus now that whatever it turns out in the next few decades, there's not going to be one modernity, which looks like, you know, for example, United States capitalism and democracy. We're going to have a multipolar world and China, for better or worse, will have a kind of something that is quite different from the economic and political system that you have uh, in the United States. China will not copy the West. I mean, hopefully China will continue to be inspired by best practices abroad, um, but at least there's not going to be this kind of model uh, that sets the path for China's development the way that people thought in 1980s. So people say, oh, 1980s, um, it was much more open. It's true, it was more open times in many ways, much more academic freedom, for example, but at least in terms of the motivating ideals, arguably it was less open than now. Now you still have liberals. We have a very famous liberal here, Professor Yoqing, but we also have Confucians and we have communists. In a way, it's, much, it's, it's more diverse, at, at least in those terms, than it was in the 1980s. So what about this Confucian comeback? Well, I mean, uh, you know, of course the historians know this, but at least in the English language, the term Confucianism is often misleading because it sounds like it's like Confucius is like to Confucianism, just like Buddha is to Buddhism or, or Jesus is to Christianity, but it's not, right? I mean, Confucius himself, he was a transmitter of an older tradition. It's a, it's a very diverse and complex tradition and that has been influenced by other traditions and including Taoism and Legalism and Buddhism uh, and, and, more, and more recently, uh, democracy and feminism. I mean, I mentioned already this, the descendants of Kong, who are very proud if they can be offered a plot in the Kongling, the Confucian family cemetery in, in Chufu. Um, and now the women can be part of the family tree for the first time. You know, it's a kind of feminist inspired reform. Um, of course, at the level of uh, scholarly re uh, research, there's also a lot of engagement between feminism and Confucianism, for example. And now I'm going to reduce confusion to very crude ways, and the intellectual historians will hate this, I apologize. But two claims that no matter what the diversity of the tradition, these are kind of mainstream views. The first is the good life. I mean, it sounds, it's, it might sound trivial, but when I'm going to say it's not that true because you have to compare it to what, right? The good life lies in the pursuit and nourishment of compassionate and harmonious social relations, starting with a family and extending beyond that. Right. So again, what, in comparison to what? Well, look at ancient Greek thinkers like, like Aristotle. The good life lies outside the family, right? The family is a sphere of necessity, but morality lies outside the family and serving the public. That's not a Confucian view at all. The Confucian view is morality starts with the family. That's where we learn about morality. And that's where we experience, at least if things go well, which often they don't. But that's where we experience care and compassion and love. And we extend that love to others, but in diminishing degree as you extend outside the family. And no matter how diverse the tradition, there's hardly anything about the afterlife. I mean, it's a bit like Marx and communism. If you, Marx has, you know, has 40 volumes, but there's only a few sentences about communism. It's similar about the Confucian tradition. Again, so this is quite, a, a, you know, in contrast to like Christianity and other traditions, um, it's quite fascinating that, you know, these, these, these debates that, you know, we, we need it. We do, can we have a social ethics without God? I mean, that's just not a big deal in the Confucian tradition. That's the good life. And the best life lies in serving the community as a public official. Again, in comparison to think of Plato's Republic, where the best life lies in, you know, a life of philosophy or con contemplating truth, and you go into the cave as a kind of second choice. Um, for, the, for the Confucians, typically, the best life lies in serving the public as a public official. Um, so, okay. That's one reason why, for example, still today, especially in Shandong province, where the Confucian tradition is, I think, most deeply influencing people's you know, everyday life and values. Um, if you're a public official, it's so important. For example, the rest of China, what's the lucky number? We know, right? It's the lucky number eight. But in Shandong, it's seven because um, it's qi shang, ba xia. When you're 57 serving as a public official, you can still have hope of being promoted. But when you're 58, then, and, you, and you, you have no longer hope of being promoted. And so this is very interesting. So on the license plate in Shandong, you would see number seven as the lucky number. I mean, and uh, again, in comparison to the rest of China. Um, 
So why the Confucian comeback? Well, very briefly, and again, very briefly, um, it was obviously a political reason that Marxism cannot serve as a sole legitimate you know, political ideal um, inspiring people. I mean, it's still a big part of the story, as we'll see. But obviously, the ruling organization views itself as a carrier of a much older political tradition. And the Confucian tradition has been, at least in imperial China, the main kind of political tradition that inspires um, uh, uh, people, I guess. Um, so the, obviously, the Chinese you know, Communist Party uh, views itself as its carrier of a longer tradition. And more and more, the Confucian discourse is used as kind of, let's call it values-based legitimacy. Again, it's a fairly new development the past few decades, obviously in comparison to the earlier uh, in China. Economic reason, well, again, here too, for most of the uh, tw you know, pr 20th century, Confucian was, was viewed as a kind of the part of the reason why China was you know, backward economically, but then all of a sudden, you know, other countries with a, East, with a Confucian heritage, South Korea, um, uh, Japan, uh, uh, Singapore, and so on, modernized in a relatively peaceful way, at least partly in response to, uh, or at least on the basis of Confucian values, like commitment to hard work, to self-improvement, to education, and uh, this worldly outlook. And China's Chinese intellectuals often came to the same realization that far from undermining economic modernization, uh, Confucian can help to promote it, of course, assuming other conditions are in place as well. And there's a psychological reason that capitalist style modernization also makes people very atomistic and individualistic. So there's a need for an, an ethic that, that, that promotes social responsibility. And again, Confucianism is the obvious uh, uh, resource for that kind of reason. And there's an academic reason that many of the contemporary, uh, or at least some of the contemporary intellectuals in China who promote Confucianism, they were first forced to read it in the culture of Lucian or to denounce it, like Jiang Qing is a famous case. And then when he read it, you know, he's a smart guy. He said, well, this is not as bad as advertised. And once there was more openness, he could openly promote Confucianism. So the, the now lots of problems with, I mean, the longest chapter in his book is on censorship. And by the way, um, the, this the English language book, is, no, the Chinese translation has not been approved, and unless things change, I don't think it will be approved, except in Hong Kong, by the way, where there's more academic freedom. But even this has been approved. The English version took a while to be approved. It has an official stamp saying that, um, basically saying that uh, it's the, it's an official stamp saying that the book is not officially approved. <laughs> 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 this book, you can. I, I, I thought it was, wow, I was kind of almost proud. I thought it might be a collector's item, but then we heard that it's quite common for English language books that have this stamp on it. Um, okay, so, okay, notwithstanding all these constraints on academic freedom in China, growing constraints, the longest chapter in here is on censorship. Um, but the in terms of the uh, resource, academic resources and debates on Confucian, very wide ranging and diverse. Um, so, but the Confucian tradition has stalled uh, yeah, uh, in, uh, lately for different reasons. I'm not going to go into, except, into detail here because I'm running out of time. Um, but the past, there was a time when, if you remember, uh, President Xi was handed two books when he went to Chufu and he says, I'm going to study this diligently about Confucianism. Um, and that's a time many people were excited. Wow, finally we're moving on to this kind of, but it, it, more or less, uh, the official kind of promotion of Confucianism has stalled. Although there is a new Confucian Academy in Shrifu, which trains public officials in the Confucian classics. There's a kind of partly because the anti-corruption campaign is moving from like heavy-handed legalist means to more kind of using Confucian means uh, to, to, to limit corruption. And of course, for that, the public officials have to be educated in the Confucian classics. And that's the task of this new Confucian Academy. Now, in the remaining few minutes, let me talk about Marxism. Um, so people say, wow, what happened? Is it present? I, I mean, no. This, the, the Karl Marxist theory of history, it's quite obvious that it, you have to, uh, there's a great book by G.A. Cohen just called Karl Marx's theory of history. He was my professor at Oxford where I first learned about Marxism. Uh, you have to go through capitalism because only capitalism can develop the productive forces to because capitalists need to compete with each other in a way to become more productive, make more progress, improve the technology. And at a certain point, we move from capitalism to the next society, which the political form of that is dictatorship of the proletariat. So I think some of the leaders came to the, you know, we can say recognition or realization or misunderstanding, however you want to interpret it, that it's time to move on to from a kind of capitalist 
society to the post capitalist society. Um, and arguably, uh, very um, crude, crude means were, uh, yeah, yeah, very crude means were, were used to do that, uh, such, such as, um, again, um, clamp downs on, on large companies um, and reducing opportunities for uh, tutors uh, so that children could, could improve, but uh, all for good reasons on the face of it, right? And if you really want to reduce the gap between rich and poor, um, you have to take sometimes measures. I mean, those measures arguably were not as effective as they could have and should have been, um, but that's, that was the basic idea that motivated and we have to understand why it happened. So the idea is here is we move on to lower communism where people are, from each according to his ability, people work hard and they're rewarded according to their contribution. And for that, we need equal opportunity. So you shouldn't get rich or have more, more uh, opportunities for education just because you're born to a rich family. Hard work determines material uh, rewards. That's problematic though, as for uh, the reason that Karl Marx said and that, and that John Rawls elaborated in great detail, um, that talent is kind of arbitrary from a moral point of view. So eventually we have to move to a different kind of society where people are rewarded according to need. So, um, so, so arguably then the, there's this, there's a, there's, we're, there's this kind of, the, you know, it's a, there's a stage now where it's partly Confucian and partly moving beyond capitalist kind of form of communism. Um, but one big difference, and here, man, think of uh, Mikhail Bakunin, the anarchist in the 19th century who criticized Karl Marx. He's saying, dictatorship of the proletariat, that's not going to happen. You're going to have dictatorship of the bureaucracy. And Karl Marx wrote some notes in Bakunin, none of which were very convincing. And more or less, arguably, that's part of what happened. Okay, one more minute. Um, and but so the question is, the bureaucracy is going to be there. The state's not going to wither away, wither away, nor should it, arguably, because now the big problems that Marx couldn't anticipate, climate change, regulation of nuclear weapons, rogue AI, and so on, you all need a strong state to deal with that. So the question is, and there's going to be some sort of synthesis between Confucianism and communism, because you need the Confucian ideas to say how to select and promote public officials with above ability and virtue. In Chinese, Xianang, Zhengzhi is a scholarly way. At the side, Jianbei is the more political uh, version of that idea. Um, that's not going to go away, um, but that's not sufficient. There's always a need for more democracy at lower levels of government, especially, and, and more reliance on, 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 on Confucian soft power and, and, and more emphasis on personal freedom and, and so on. That said, even if you have this mixture of Confucianism and, and communism that, is, that also has a kind of democratic aspect, there's going to be tension between communists and 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 commun and communist and Confucian ideals, uh, because at the end of the day they're different. For Marx, the ultimate idea is to have a society where advanced machinery does the socially necessary work, and people are free to realize their creative essences. So it's through work. Life work becomes life's prime want. You're not working because you have to, but because you want to. That's the kind of Marxist ideal. But for Confucians, a good life lies in social relations. Sometimes they, 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 they have the tension, right? I mean, when I presented this in Shanghai, you know, uh, 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 somebody said to me, well, that's what we do. I was, she's a younger woman. And she said, that's what we, in my case, should I pursue my career, my family? And that's, that's the sort of thing that's going to, uh, that's it's still going to be in tension. Um, so I, I raced through this and this is but, uh, our, our cat, um, <laughs> because we have in the, one of the chapters in here, the culture of cuteness. Okay. And again, one of my failures as Dean is that, I basically uh, re sometimes re evaded responsibility by relying on, on humor uh, and, and, and charm. And I, I, I think Michael um, Boris Johnson is, is a beautiful example of what, what not to do. You know, as a political leader, you, you should have a strong ethic of responsibility and, and not rely on cuteness and charm and humor. Um, so anyway, I have a chapter on that in, in this book as well. So thank you. Nice thank you. Well, keep the black cat, white cat there, because after all, as long as it catches the mouse, <laughs> you know that, right? Um, <clears throat> hi. Yeah, okay. Um, my name is Peter Boyle. I teach Chinese history, and I've known Daniel for a number of years. I'm, I'm interested in, in Chinese intellectual history in particular. And I, I, you know, when I began in college in the 1960s, uh, Confucius and Confucianism were purely historical subjects. There was not; they were not relevant to China today. Remember, it was in the nineteen sixties, and I, 
I think the second year I was in college, the Cultural Revolution began. So, um, and yet, like Lazarus from the dead, right, keeps coming back. Uh, I, I should say that you know Daniel Bell has made some important contributions uh, to the study of Confucianism uh, and the awareness of Confucianism in China today through the series he's done at Princeton University Press, uh, which it combines both the introduction of some major Chinese thinkers who are not communist thinkers. Some of them are Confucian thinkers, um, but it's a particular kind of Confucianism. It's not the spiritual Confucianism that we would associate with Mo Zung San or Professor Dewey Ming, who taught here for many years, but it's much more, I would say, a political institutional Confucianism. Um, and sometimes um, there's another thing that's happened, although there have been these institutes for the study of Confucianism, I think more common are the institutes for the study of Guoxue, national learning. And one question we could ask is, is there a connection between national learning, ideas about national learning, and what's called the Ru or the Confucian tradition? Um, it, <clears throat> it's often, I think, easy to start to think of Confucianism as a social political system in the same way that we think of communism in China or socialism in China as a social political system, which has its own particular Chinese characteristics. So it makes sense to talk about that. Although we would say that communism in ideology, in fact, is also tr always often treated as a social political system. And I think we treat Confucianism the same way. But I wonder whether that is what we should be doing. Um, clearly, Confucians were concerned with practice, and so to the degree that they have a political philosophy, social political philosophy, then they are concerned with practice and its realization in actual life. It is clearly a value system associated with the political elite, but remember the political elite in China was in the past, what, maybe 5% of the national educated elite? Right, So we should not be perhaps misled by thinking that politically active people define uh, the uh, Confucian tradition. Um, but still, I mean, th there's understandable why we would take a sort of a notion of Confucianism as a social political system and, and see it in those terms. The question then is, is this social political system particularly Confucian or not? And along the way, I think Daniel uh, offered us an alternative would say, well, yes, there's Confucius way back when, but then, you know, there was a centralized bureaucratic system of the Qin dynasty. Uh, there is, uh, there's Buddhism, there's Taoism, all these other things. And so that Confucianism then becomes what? It becomes a kind of a value system, strong on family, belief in public responsibility, state service, and things like this. Um, but I would like to suggest that Confucianism, in fact, from Confucius through the present, almost through the present, was all was really a mode of learning, a way of learning, rather than a social political system. Um, and it's a way of learning that stressed self-cultivation, personal practice, but in many different ways that was not constant over time, um, that believed in the value of cultural traditions, but what those traditions were, had to be defined and redefined over time, and believed in public responsibility to a point. After all, as Confucius who says, you know, at the one point he says, well, Dao Boucher, if my way um, isn't going to be practiced, or if I can't keep practicing on, that, on my way, I'll set the sea on a raft, right? That refusal to serve is just as important as a willingness to serve. Um, and the other part of Confucianism or, or Confucian learning, let me say, from way back when into the present is the rejection of the notion that the ruler is a sage. Mm -hmm. And so to make the claim that the ruler is a sage, right, is something that I think by and large, people who style themselves as Shreja in the Confucian mode are going to reject. Yeah. Yeah. And Xi Jinping may think he's a sage, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that but I'm sure if I'm not, I don't know if he does think of himself as a sage, uh, but rulers sometimes get into that habit. I mean, uh, Kang Shi was a good example of that and the others. 
But there, there is, I think, a way in which we can think about Confucianism in sort of a, either a top-down perspective or a bottom-up. The top-down perspective says it's very good for people to be docile, to be quiet, to think of themselves as parts of groups, to think about the importance of ritual and ritually correct behavior, um, and that's what we want, right? Rulers do tend to like that. Um, and yet there's learning for the individual, and this we could bring this back to Confucius, and I was influenced by my students in class today where we were talking about the, uh, how Confucius understood this very difficult term, ren, sometimes translated as humaneness, benevolence, which ultimately says, no, it's not the group, it's not the state, it's the individual. It's the individual and the cultivation of the individual that matters. Um, and so question I would like to ask is, can Confucianism survive in a meaningful way? Can there be a Confucianism of the national elite and of the state? Um, sir, can it survive without actual Confucians? And are there actual Confucians in China? Um, the, uh, in the sense, not in terms of people who, who buy into this notion of we all should be good citizens, we should love our family, take care of our parents and so on, and be responsibly, socially responsible, but actually who are committed to cultivating themselves, even if it means going against the state. So I'm the, I'm the end my comments with a story. And my story is begins, I guess, in the 17th century when Huang Zongxi, known to some people for his, his great political treatise, the Mingyi Daifang Lu, the plan for the prince waiting for the dawn, um, uh, wrote the, the Ming Ru the, 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 the studies of Ming Confucians. And he begins with an account of a man named Fang Shaoru. And Fang Shaoru had been a high official and advisor to the emperor, the grandson of the Ming founder, Juan Zhang, who had been skipping over a generation, had been made emperor to succeed him. His brother, or his uncle, Zhu Di, up in the north in Beijing, would have none of that. And he decided he would come south with his armies and usurp the throne, which he proceeded to do. And Fang Shaoru, being a famous scholar, um, he told Fang Shaoru, you're going to issue a statement saying that basically I'm like the Duke of Zhou coming to aid Prince Cheng, right? That I'm here to save the state, to save the dynasty. And Fang Shaoru refused. And so he and all his relatives to the ninth degree were executed. And that's how he begins the Ming Ru Shui'an. And the, but the first case, the first case of learning discussed in the Ming Ru Shui'an is about somebody else. It's about Wu Yubi, a man named Wu Yubi. And Wu Yubi's father had been the number one graduate of the civil service examinations under the emperor that had been usurped. And when Zhu Di, the usurper, came to town, Wu Yubi from Jiangxi was one of the people that came out to greet him. And in return for betraying his emperor, he was made chancellor of the National University. Um, Wu Yubi refused to take the exams and refused to serve and was absolutely quiet and kept at home because he's a great embarrassment to his family. He was not participating as he should, son of the, a brilliant son of, of, the, of his father, the chancellor of the National University. Um, and Wu Yubi became a great scholar because the day Yung Le died, he began a diary, which we now have, in which he talked about his desire to cultivate himself and the difficulties of self-cultivation. And he began his diary with a dream of King Wen, Wen Wang, the founder of the Zhou dynasty, and then a second dream of Zhu Xi, and a third reflection on the way in which the second emperor of the Song dynasty in the 10th century probably murdered his brother, the first emperor, and then proceeded for the rest of the diary to talk about his spiritual cultivation. Um, so we see a state that's willing to murder the opposition. We see a state that's anxious for co-optation. We see Confucians once in a while who are committed to integrity and authenticity and are willing to engage in martyrdom. Um, 
I think that literati generally, as a national elite, believe in a centralized bureaucratic system. I think it's very much part of it. I don't think they necessarily believe in a strong state. And the degree to which we see a commitment to strong states among the literati, or to the state among the literati, or, or to a strong state, it can mean that they're looking for ways to bend the government to their interests, not to pursue government. So um, this tension, I think, is a real tension, not just between Confucianism and communism, but between being a Confucian and the notion of a strong state. Thank you. I'll stop there and ask uh, Professor Yu to continue. And you too will get your 10 minutes of glory. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry again for being late. The traffic. Um, no, that's fine. Really, Continue. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I hope my, my comment is worthwhile. So, uh, good afternoon. And I want to first thank Fairbank Center for inviting me to join this fascinating conversation with two professors. And it's really uh, a great honor. So, Professor Bell, uh, thank you for the fascinating presentation. I actually also really enjoyed reading our new book, The Dean of Shandong. And uh, it has a lot of fascinating details and analysis that actually help to humanize contemporary China as the book intends to do. Uh, especially this is important because we're in the context of escalation of confrontational of ideologies. So uh, Professor Bao uh, brought up a very important topic, uh, the direction that China is heading in terms of its political values and identity. So I'm sure many of us are, are sitting here are concerned about this. So to fully grasp uh, Professor Bao's uh, proposal about combining Confucianism with communism, I think it's useful to first look at the context of the overall debates and the different ideas about the role of Confucian tradition in shaping China's political ideologies. So indeed, in the post-Mao period, Confucian learning has made a comeback. But I want to emphasize that it is not one single uniform concept, right? So as an intellectual historian, I actually see various interpretations and forms of Confucian traditions. And these various positions are attached to different intellectual groups with diverse ideologies and methodologies. So for example, there's the group we can call the cultural liberal group. And they see Confucian learning as promoting a kind of Chinese humanism that tends towards civic nationalism. So what does it mean? Uh, they are committed to the idea of nurturing people in modern democracies by emphasizing civic duty and personal autonomy. This view uh, largely aligned with China's move toward market economy and the political changes in most of the 90s. I think Peter just spoke to this tradition. And then the second influential camp that emerged uh, during this time, and slightly later, was associated with what we call the new left movement. And many of them aim to blend socialism with Confucian ideas. And many of them actually call it as Confucian socialism. And different from the first camp, the second camp actually leaned more toward populism and social equality within the Confucian tradition. So they pick on different things from the tradition. So they believe that China's modern values should be rooted in social equality and a strong collective identity. And they also supported a centralized state to achieve this social, the goal of social equality. And they were critical of Western style representative democracy and global capitalism. So they saw China's contemporary success um, are connected to its historical state institutions and its communist heritage. And this group gained prominence in the early 2000s. And so at the same time, there is a third camp that is more utopian and therefore is more controversial, which asks for reforming China into a constitutional monarchy with Confucian serving as a symbolic meritocratic ruler that represent universal values. I think Jiang Qing represent this third camp. So they are also critical of liberal democracy, right? But, but their criticism of liberal democracy were mainly from aspect of political meritocracy. And it sometimes aligns with the second camp in terms of their interest in experimenting with a unique China model of government. So these positions are not new. 
right? So they have a history that going back to debates about China's modern nation building started in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, if not earlier. So Professor Bao point out that the resurgence of communist ideas in China was understandable, especially in the context of the Southern aid, global financial crisis, and the increasing criticism of capitalism. And he stressed that uh, he stressed the importance of blending communism with Confucianism because it could offer the Communist Party a way to choose officials based on Mary, as well as developing China's culture. So this is fascinating because it seems like a solution that combines the second position, Confucian socialism, and some elements of the third position, political democracy. And this solution is in fact very similar to a viewpoint from the early 20th century, which actually played a crucial role in shaping China's 1911 nationalist revolution and constitution. Okay, so one of the leading contributors, for, for instance, to this position was a man called Zhang Kaiyan, I wish the center of a part of my research. So he is a highly influential modern Confucian thinker and the leading propagandist of China's nationalist revolution. And he argues for something that can be summarized as what we call populist meritocracy. And this term might sound very unusual, right? Because populism and meritocracy seem like opposing ideas. But this combination was actually very meaningful to many intellectuals, as well as to the revolutionary leaders such as Sun Yat-sen. So for the populist side, this argument begins with a criticism of parliamentary representation as an impediment to social equality. They argue that Western and Japanese representative system are essentially the modern extension of the feudal aristocracy, which let rich local elites easily influence politics, accumulate wealth, and perpetuate their privileges at the expense of the ordinary people. And importantly, it has to be the centralized state based on ruthless punishment of corruption with power of redistributing land to, and the house control influence of this modern aristocrat. And equally important, they turn to China's long centralized bureaucratic state as China's essential legacy for this modernization. Right. So it has been around for 2000 years and has successfully removed ancient nobility. So this for them, this legacy should not be quickly replaced by Western ways. Of course, there is a strong element of totalitarianism in this. So at the same time, there is a meritocratic side to it. So for Zhang, the government's legislation and administration needs to be reserved for highly qualified scholars who deeply understand the nation's unique history and culture and devoted themselves to the nation's collective interest and identity. So, and this should be the responsibility of the so-called true Confucian learning tradition. So what I wanna say is that people who embraced this idea in early 20th century, they were often supportive of, supportive of socialist ideas entering China at the moment. And this is understandable and even admirable. It is because throughout the world at that moment, newly rising nations in the late 19th century and early 20th century were combating social problems caused by unregulated capitalism and European imperialism. So at that time, not many people were too concerned about the authoritarian aspect of it. This makes sense because in the middle of the turbulent 20th century, when China was mired by wars, the problem of the state overexpansion was probably the last thing to worry about. This way of thinking made a comeback in the early 2000s. It was primarily associated with the Confucian socialism of the new leftists, but it also speaks to the concern of the institutional Confucians who are interested in meritocracy. So this position gained traction after 2008 and coincided with a critical moment for the Chinese Communist Party. So when Xi Jinping took office, the party was facing a major legitimacy crisis due to corruption issues that had been brewing since the 90s. The ideas of Confucian socialism, which mixed elements of populism and meritocracy inspired by China's historical centralized bureaucracy, actually helped Xi to address the party's legitimacy crisis because it is both socialist 
and it is rooted in Chinese traditions. And this particular interpretation of Confucianism celebrates China's unique historical path and views Chinese Marxism as a logical choice in line with China's historical values. Moreover, the model gained prominence thanks to China's rapid recovery from the 2008 financial crisis and its impressive infrastructure development afterwards. However, so this is my turning point, unlike the mid 20th century, many people today start to see the authoritarian side of this approach as a genuine concern, especially when the party control has become so strong. Right. So this concern becomes even more apparent when the government cracked down on business leaders, enforced strict COVID measures, and become entangled in an increasingly hostile international environment, all in an effort to build loyalty among citizens. But I think what's important to remember is that there have been different approaches within China's journey to nation building. So take cultural liberals, for instance. They see the heart of Confucian learning as more about individual responsibility in society than being tied to a particular state system. And this view values the practice of self-governance. So for them, even though the centralized state was the primary model for the Chinese institution, local leaders actually did have a significant role in to play in China's history during the late imperial period. And this should be drawn upon very fast. This should be drawn upon as the basis for a genuine representative system. So many people who share this view see issues like overexpansion of state power, decreasing job opportunities in the private sectors, and alienation of talents in central administration and as well as China's uncertain global positions as significant concerns. And they consider this to be as consequential as social inequality. So I'm curious about Professor Bell's thought about how the model of blending Confucianism with communism based on your particular interpretation of this two can respond to these challenges. Thank you very much. No, I was told I should moderate this discussion. Okay, so the beginning is to ask you whether you'd like to to respond to your discussions. Um, okay, it's it's not really a response because I basically agree with most of what was said. Um, so let me just focus on the parts where maybe there might be slight disagreement um, about well, the, the the line of that the refusal to serve uh, is just as important as a willingness to serve. Uh, as a kind of Confucian view, I, I would I would modify that a little bit because the first choice is still to serve, but it's only when things are really bad that you would want to like exit and 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 do your own stuff to use colloquial language. So it, it's still like almost the opposite of the Platonic view, where your first choice is you know contemplating the forms and so on, and only then do you reluctantly enter politics. But for the Confucian view, it's almost a reversal. The first choice is to serve as public official. But if things are really bad, then you 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 exit the system and sometimes even become a Taoist, right? Um, so uh, that that the, now about whether there are Confucians, I mean, I think that it was fully answered. Um, I think these are great distinctions by cultural liberals, Confucians, socialists, and constitutional monarchs. Um, so I mean, there are still just if we Confucians who pursue pure self cultivation now, and Jiang Qing is a good example. He has a private academy in Guizhou Province. He's, he has basically, I don't think, much hope of influencing the political system anymore. So he just does his own thing, cultivates himself, and trains students, and hopefully in the future, uh, in and they might have some impact. Um, but then there's also Confucians who think you can make it within the system, make some positive changes. Uh, I agree, they owe their ultimate allegiance to the Tao, not to the state, or not certainly not to the ruler. Um, and my, my the party secretary, who 
who you know is, was who hired me was one of them. Um, several others now who are uh, who I know. I mean, I won't name them here, but they they think that through serving the public, sometimes even as in Marxist institutes, um, you could you could enact positive change. So I mean, there but there are confusions too. But there's a trade off, just you know, time between how much you can do as a self cultivation versus serving the public. I mean, if you are a public official, you don't have much time to read, right? So you you you, you, can, you can't do both. That doesn't mean that. Those who pursue the public official track are less pure Confucians. I'm not sure that that that's a way. Uh, and about Confucians not favoring the strong state, it depends what we mean by that. So I didn't talk much about this, but in this book, I mean, I have quite a bit on the legalist tradition. I think that's a better way of, of framing it than the word authoritarian, which I, to me is so vague. It's not really clear what it means. Um, but the legalist tradition is 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 very influential today, and that's really what justifies what we think as the worrisome part of the strong state, which controls people's lives and limits their freedom and arbitrarily. Well, if it's a pure legalist, here, here my colleague Bai Tonglong is good. He's saying, actually, if you're pure legalist, you, you, it would be pretty clear and transparent rule of law. You wouldn't like disappear into a black hole. That's not legalism. Um, but anyway, so, but even the anti-corruption campaign, I had some of the top leaders, they would tell me, I don't know a lot, just one, yeah, anyway, sometimes this, you, you know, you know, we're using legalist means but you can't openly say it, but that's 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 how they think of what they're doing, not so much the authoritarian language. And because in times of chaos, if you really want to solve things quickly, Confucian means are just not effective. You know, whether it's COVID in the early days or or, or warfare and civil war in, in the 20th century or the warring states period, I mean, you know, you have to sometimes use these these legalist harsh measures for what, but only in the short term, and it's not meant to be long lasting. The problem is once you put them in place, how to take them away? For COVID, the first two years, China felt like the luckiest place in the world to be in. You know, we were there during COVID, and the rest of the world seemed to be poisoned. And here we are, completely free in a huge country. We travel and have lots of personal freedom. But then, it, as you know, last year things went sour very, very quickly, and it and and the bureaucracy was not quick to change. And when it changed, it was much too quick. So, it, so that that that's the problem is when legalism outlasts its kind of um, its kind of uh, uh, life, so to speak. But even then, pure legalism won't work. I mean, the reason why COVID was effective the first two years is that because almost, you know everybody bought into the system it's bought in it's not like the u.s where or even canada where i'm from where people didn't want to wear masks sometimes you know there was this is what we need to do to to preserve our our, our you know relative well-being and some of these harsh measures may be justified but again only temporarily and the problem is that it it, it would last it much too long um so that's fascinating, by the way, about Zhang Taiyan as a populist meritocrat. I would love to read more about that. Thank you. Although I'm told it's extremely difficult. <laughs> but anyway, um, so so thank you. I, I really do do want to 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 learn more uh, about that. Um, and I'd like to know who you see. You have these three labels: uh, cultural, uh, liberal, Confucians, and Confucian socialists, and 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 the Confucian monarchs. And you mentioned Jiang Qing as representing the third. I'd like to know who you place into each category. That would be very interesting as well. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, let's turn this open uh, to, to questions. We, uh, um, all the way in back, yes. Uh, Ms. Elliot, how, how late do we go till? Hard stop at six. Okay, good. And so, in what sense you see the communist class of the land of land with uh, Confucianism as a sort of uh, Confucian's legalist state, or like using Chairman Mao's word, like <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, yeah. In the sense that it seems that
Did you? You need to respond. Oh, She's not going to let him have a second question. Okay. Okay. Okay, hi. So I didn't mean to imply, it's a great, great point. I didn't mean to imply that Fajr was always temporary. I'm saying that from a moral point of view, it's only justified as a temporary measure to deal with social chaos. Um, and if it extends beyond that, which it often does, then it lo loses its moral justification and, become, and, and becomes problematic. Um, so th 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 that's what I meant. I mean, in the Chinese, you know, that's why it's like today when I, People said that what the Chinese Communist Party thinks. I mean, I don't. What does that mean? I mean, it's a huge organization. You know, not, as you know, over ninety million people. Even within the bureaucracy that I worked with, almost all the leaders were Communist Party members. But so diverse views, and and this tension plays itself out out today. I mean, and and I worry about this increasing legalism now. Um, and and it's and and that that's the part that we worry about. Not so much a strong state per se, but this the the kind of the legalists, meaning that there's a the use of harsh punishments and, and fear uh, to to control people in an almost totalitarian way. Obviously, um, uh, that's the worry. And and in this book, I mean, I say that to the extent I have a political motivation, I, I want to de demonize China, show the humane and humorous side. Um, but where does the demonization come from? I mean. And this is, it's, you know, the legalist resurgence, so to speak, it's also a reaction to external forces. I mean, if the, the Chinese leaders feel encircled and feel that the world's dominant power wants to stop or contain its economic development or, or worse, you know, uh, bring about the collapse of the political system, it strengthens the kind of legalist forces, you know, paranoid forces in the security apparatus. And, and the more kind of Confucian aspect becomes marginalized. So to the extent that I have any hope in China, I mean, it does depend on an external environment, which which does less to, to demonize China. Yeah. Uh, Professor Wu up in there. Thank you. On uh, your comment, leads me exactly to the question that is sort of in my mind um, during this presentation, which is um, to what extent internally, as you were thinking about how to promote Confucianism and how to develop Confucianism and Communism, was there awareness that in doing so, you were changing the foreign policy narrative and exactly how the rest of the periphery sees China and creating a more hostile environment that was in turn strengthening to the extent that there is a struggle amongst Confucius, strengthening the hand of the legalists, as you had suggested. So in some ways, right, just like other cycles where Confucianism has had to struggle with a powerful state leader and struggles within schools of Confucianism that affected the outside. Um, was there awareness of that? I, I asked this question specifically because some of you may recall Professor David Holm was here last year, and he was surprised at how much um, this turn, what was an internal discourse, had affected the way the rest of the world saw China and in turn created this type of vertical effect. So having had a seat at the table, was this even a consideration at all that there would be these forms of unintended consequences? Um, or does this come as much a surprise to you as it did to you? So the, the, so the surprise for Professor Yen, sorry, could you rephrase it? I'm not 100% sure what it was. So you may have the Yeah. Policy and specifically the Shia reform policy uh, through yeah. a connection with traditional legal thought, particularly um, different forms of thinking about which China's people will have been in creating a humane international society, but through the yeah. same yeah. place. So that language sparked various different reactions. Oh, oh, oh. Through some of the policy. Oh, okay, okay. Through what it's doing in the South Sea. Okay. And so okay. on that interim discourse, okay. turn, right, that created, as you suggested, a hostile environment which strengthened the hands of the legalists internally within China to create some of the more disturbing trends, but it was initially that melding of Confucianism and Confucianism policy 
which affected that debate, and, and confusion is a bit about the next, this is a bit past in tradition, obvious thoughts. Okay. It would have been, it had sparked a different form of reaction in terms of the song chart. Okay. So curious, he, for him, it was a bit of a surprise because certainly that was not the intention. Okay, he, you're he, right, yeah. So, okay. He highlighted the richness of the, in the debate. Yeah. The right, that. yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so Professor Yen Shui Tong, uh, we translated one, one of his books for this series, and, and it was called Ancient Chinese Thought and Modern Chinese Power. And when President Biden was vice president, he came to Beijing, and he was photographed holding this book as he boarded the plane. You know, so in those days, it, was, it wasn't viewed as a problem. It was, uh, so, so I'm not, so he, he argues, as you know, that um, there's, there's, the, he, that there should be a humane government that inspires people both at home and abroad, and he uses a Confucian language to express that. Um, and he was he was before that book was published. He was viewed as a kind of hardliner in, in in a hawk, but actually it turns out actually he's much more committed to you know what we would call or what what we would call soft power or or uh, or Confucian norms uh, on the international level. Um, but. Eventually, that changed. So not just his views, but Zhao Tingyang and others who, who who use the language of Tianxia. That's viewed as a kind of, you know, nativist. You know, but it's not. I mean, it's pro, it's providing an alternative, which is not meant to be, you know, necessarily pro-China, but one way of, of a morally justified international relations that draws upon Confucian ideas. For example, the Confucian idea that if you are a strong state. Um, you 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 shouldn't assume that you have equal responsibilities. In fact, you have more responsibilities um, than than weaker states, and you should try to provide a political system that is in the interest of both the strong and the weak states. I mean, what's wrong with that? But somehow, this this the critics who who somehow think that's meant to challenge the kind of liberal order portray this as as sinister and, and pro China. That gets distorted, um, I think. Uh, yeah. But but maybe my 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 fellow panelists have more to say on this. Um, we'll let the audience ask more questions. I think. Okay. Uh, right here. Yeah. And then. Um. So by actually the panelists, um, I'm going to say on the issues of emphasize um a functional advantages of why that would explain the appeal of Confucianism to a modern political view. Um, it seems like another possible function is kind of simply the kind of cultural glue function that it provides, the actual kind of content of the values, the fact that it's rooted in a tradition locally in a kind of nationalist era is very useful. I think that also opens up possible comparison to other large kind of Aspiringly civilizational countries, Russia, Turkey, Islam, and so forth. The appeal of the QCS simply because it's Chinese and be the nationalist narrative versus the unique content of. Okay, you want that's. Yeah, I mean, so, it, yeah. it strikes me that this gets gets to a very interesting point, which is when you use Confucian, sometimes I think what you just mean is. <clears throat> when you use Confucian, sometimes I think that what you mean is just Chinese. Yeah. Right. And well, uh, yeah. Okay. So is, I think what you're getting at in part, right? So I, I think, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, that's not my I, I intention, but I, I agree sometimes it's easy to view it that way. But I mean, there's a difference between the kind of philosophical Confucian or the high Confucianism. If you look at the great texts, they don't. Typically, it's not about being Chinese. Certainly, not being ethnic Chinese. It's it's being committed to certain ethical norms. And if you're if you're from other places and you're committed to the same norms, then you can be Confucian too. It wasn't meant to be. And Peter probably can think of many counterexamples. But typically speaking, that wasn't the case. And even now, those who def the intellectuals who defend Confucianism, it's not. I mean, maybe it's partly because it's from, if you're especially from Shandong province, especially, or maybe if you're from the Kong family. Yeah, there's a kind of pride and and sense of identity that those who are not 
from the Kong family or from Shandong or from China may not have. But still, if you if if at the level of intellectual understanding, it's it's a kind of universal ethic, just as liberalism is or or, or Christianity, and it's not meant to be exclusive. And you know, and when Vietnamese or uh, uh, pride themselves on their Confucian heritage, that's that's great. I mean, it shouldn't be viewed as as a distinctly um, Chinese idea. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I want to push that back a little bit because I feel like I don't have much of it either. They all have a shared vision of sort of uh, like uh, a society of lonely society that can show with Chinese and that sort of uh, a strive in utopia um, is I think something that is shared to ideologies. So I can see how so this value of uh, the active already in the news is also something that can be valid in books. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering from so a longer sort of physical perspective, um, we see some of the Chinese culture as being able to perform a lot of outside influences. We actually coming back to in 70, 700 day we have the Buddhism coming to China. Confusion and the for that during a long period, two hundred years from the Tang Dynasty all the way to the Tang Dynasty. Get to the question. Do you think the communism will be informed by the Tang Dynasty one day in more than two hundred years? Um, thank you. I mean, just one, I, I mean, that what they have in common at very basic is the idea that the first task government is to alleviate with poverty. Because for Confucians, if you're poor, you know, in the case of Mengzi and, and many others, it's very hard to be moral if you're fighting for necessities all the time. You had that in the early Confucian side, and, and China was the first country, I think, large country anyway, to, to say the government's task is to provide for the ma basic material resources of people. The Marxists had the same idea that you have you have to overcome material necessity for people to realize their creative essences, but in both cases the ultimate aim we can call it utopian, but it's it's meant to benefit individuals. It's not meant to benefit some abstract collectivity above individuals. For Marxists, it's it's to have the capacity to realize your creative talents. That's really and once advanced machinery does all the necessary work, then we we should be free to do that. And for Confucians, once we have poverty uh, taken care of, then people can be can commit themselves to others in a, in a socially responsible way without worrying about fighting for necessities. Um, and, and so th th that's, I, I think that that's, that's the kind of uh, commonality, but the, what you should do when you have free time, that's where the difference is. I mean, for, for Marxists, it's really realizing your creative essence, essence through work and for, and for Confucians, it's through your harmonious and compassionate social relations. And they, uh, there's no uh, going to be an ultimate melting of the two because they pull in different directions often, right? I mean, we can feel this tension, as as mentioned in that case, uh, or that when when I when I gave the talk, they often pull in different directions. So that there's not going to be a, this kind of, you know, this harmonious resolution of, of the tension. Did you want to intervene? Yeah. 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 Okay, Professor Hankins. Very sharp coming for protection of Confucianism, communism, having a kind of view beyond other victims. Table marriage. Uh, but it occurred to me that in the West, it was very long marriage, it's very similar between Christianity and Confucian. And they started mm -hmm. together in the fourth century AD, and they had an age ups and downs certain times and, and they, they have certain resemblance to Christianity and establish religion, Christ morality is kind of logical coming uh, where the classic Christian 
game it has spots it's just like it has uh, it tries to model itself on one of the figures in the past essentially to the storm of the universe uh, like the Chinese tradition so there's a lot of analogies I think between the um, Kalugio and the time to the um, marriage of Christianity and classes mm -hmm. and marriage of communism Uh, one thing I think that you didn't mention about Confucianism, the reason for its revival is pride. Chinese people say, we have something. Right. Right. And then hmm. this Chinese pride goes, it goes back in Chinese Pride is a pretty hard yeah. Anyway, my. I, I know that um, there are ups and downs in the relationship between Christianity and classical tradition. And one of the low points of classical tradition is precisely when Christianity is threatened by Islam. Mm. And outside um, threat uh, makes people regard classical tradition as essentially a luxury. Uh, it brings up all of the Christianity developments with the jihad and the cities. So that's interesting. But there's also, the other side, which is the Christianity, uh, tradition starts to develop a much broader classical education, not just the elite, but every, in very large parts of society become classically educated, Renaissance. That's what ultimately kind of breaks the power of Christianity or the political system, mm. which I think is a good thing. <laughs> But I'm asking, so my question to you is, what prospects do you think there are for a broader humanization of China? Uh, I, I, I understand that it's being taught in schools. It's a sort of it's top down command for people to study, to study Jewish classes. And then move us in the path to revive Confucius um, at the kind of pulp in our love and to make it what was talking about five percent of the group of Confucians are, are all the politics and 95 percent presumably just being on Confucianist in the form of self division So what prospect would there be in China today for Confucianism to reassert itself as a form of and not simply as a way to get ahead um thank you do, do you want to no, no. Go ahead, take that one yourself <laughs> um i mean it, it so uh, as dean I, I think i mentioned already the the big problem that i faced was hiring teachers who had sufficient knowledge of the tradition and who could teach it in interesting ways to students so until there's there's that critical mass i'm not that optimistic but I think it is changing. I mean, even in my faculty, we had several teachers who who, who were well well trained in the classics and and who could and and who could do it. So um, I, I think I'm at the I mean, and it depends too. Right at the primary school level, the most common text that's taught is the Di Zogui, which we can translate as the uh, how would you translate? Um, it's this Qing Dynasty text that's taught to young children usually um, to teach them about feel piety and other Confucian values. But it's a really interesting text because they, it says, for example, if your parent does something morally wrong, what should you do? And then and they say, well, first you should, uh, uh, I, I thought this because my, my own kid was was learning it. So I, I, I went through the course with him, you know, and so, well, first, first you criticize them. And what if that doesn't work? Well, then you wait till your parent is in the right mood and then you try again. And what if that doesn't work? Well, then you cry and you work on their emotions. And then if what if that doesn't work? Well, then if the part that's not modern is if you if they hit you, you just take it, you know. But anyway, so those sorts of texts are, are being taught at primaries. So at different levels of education, there's different sorts of texts um, that are taught. And the more that happens, um, the more I'm 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 a bit optimistic about the revival of Confucian. But it has to be taught in interesting ways. I mean, that's a thing. Sorry, just one tiny last point, especially for university students, it has to be taught in a way that that in, that allows for for debate and engagement. So, um, we, so it, what, what what this is not just one. I you know one thing that was commonly done was, for example, we was a course on Shinza, 
and and we had the students read uh, well, only a few uh, few passages and and just send uh, send comments before two parts that you agree with, two parts you disagree with, and two parts that you don't understand. And then the teacher, on the basis of those comments, would organize the debate. You know, and that sort of thing um, is is one way to teach the classics in interesting ways for students, uh, university students. And and if you have that, then it might have. Uh, we, with my uh, with my friend, uh, we went to the Jixia Xue Gong, the the kind of the old academy where you had these debates in the warring states period and they, they, they discovered recently that when we visited it was just a cornfield but now they discover the real location and and i and i and i had uh, some people visiting the university from the united front i said well what can we do to promote confusion i said re-establish this academy and have debates there anyway that hasn't okay. happened yet but that Pressure. might be one way of doing it is Something possible. Uh, what kind of reply spinning in her face? What happened to it? If we find the reasons, shut the mind of their phrase and her birth. A family is a very cold vein of confusion. Okay, so that mm -hmm. seems in institution level, there's high and selective revival. Of confusion. But slowly in the space, huh? I mean, that's very strong thing is conformalism in, in the recent body of confusion. Uh, morality, that is working hard, but obey uh, long as what. Lack of this ethos of the independence, uh, the self government, being even critical and rebelling. Uh, is, I think it's a very selective use of it. So the bottom question is, is it instrumental adapt of tradition or real combine? So there's always human rights. When you say the balance, what is men, what is this, what is you? This is a question I ask. Thank you. Um, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. And uh, of course, blindly obeying the leader, that's not a Confucian value. I mean, that arguably comes from the legalist tradition. So, Or, or from Moism. It sounds a lot more like Lord's right. thoughts than, than anything else. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. So, I mean, all critical intellectuals, you know, have the obligation to expose the misuses of Confucianism. And for that, you need the freedom of speech. And so I worry, just as you do, I'm sure, about the decreasing opportunities for to freely express criticism in China. And so long as that happens, it's hard to be optimistic about the revival of, of Confucianism. Um, about the declining marriage rates, I mean, of course, Confucianism isn't the whole story. And there's so many other sociological and and, and economic factors that, that explain that. And I, and I would... And I'm not sure using Confucianism as a way to counter that might help. Um, but if it's presented in a, a problem about Confucianism too, is that again, it's often viewed as a kind of patriarchal tradition that, that women reject. And if you're going to use this Confucianism to try to persuade, you know, families to get, or people to get married and, and have more children, that's so long as there's this patriarchal view that this is the Confucian view, um, that's not going to be effective. So that's why there's a need for more feminist reinterpretations of Confucianism. And for that too, there's a need for more freedom of speech than is currently available. Yes, the, the blue shirt. Right? Yeah, next to the red shirt. <laughs> Thank you. So you can see it's an opposite question. That is, you know, you think that the spell over politicizes the institution. On the third thing, there's a tendency in Western institutions of studies to under politicize, under institutional institutions, where either the specific political institutions, people of tax, are downright neglected, or to the extent that they are taken into consideration. You get the impression that to be a public confusion is to be a kind of sent back to the moment that happens to care about the campaign and passing the margin. Um, and so I'm wondering if you think that thinking of Confucianism as a political institutional doctrine is a known starter to start with, or to the extent that you think it is productive, I'm wondering like, if you think of the methodology 
um, who are doing that should be, I you think should be done broadly and I think any scholar that embodies your view. Um, that that uh, are very good questions and that require longer and in-depth answers. But I think my the basic issue that I have is I think that we need uh, to separate out some notion of what we this word Confucian from Chineseness from Chinese tradition, so that Confucianism becomes a category that seems to fill fill all the space. Right, that's not communist. And it's about presented as an alternative to that, although legalism comes in as another thing. Um, I think Confucianism is, is a complicated subject, but it's built certainly, and I go back to what I said before, I think it's Confucian, Confucianism as practice is a mode of learning. It's not a political system. Uh, Mr. Schroeder, Mr. Schrader, sorry. Uh, green, green shirt. Thanks so much. Uh, all the speakers, I say Schrader, to see see history. Uh, I have a question for Professor Bell. You spoke a little bit about the sorts of texts that are that are being read, but I'd like to ask more specifically: what what texts are trying to do Confucius reading? Are they only focusing on the classical and pre-classical texts? Are they reading the new Confucian commentaries and other Confucian texts from the Middle Period? Um, are they only reading? later um, commentaries or secondary sources on these texts, and how are they reading these texts? Are they reading them in Chinese, or are they reading translations and commentaries in modern vernacular? Well, thank you. That's a huge question. And I mean, it depends how good academics they are, right? I mean, if they're good academics, they would read them in the original, and, and many do. And and some of them, like the probably the most famous Confucian scholar now in, in China is Chen Lai at, at Tsinghua, and he makes his students read them all in classical Chinese. And because so many, and, and it's the whole tradition, well, I mean, it's many aspects of the tradition, and because he has so many students, now it, more and more they read the, those who are more, well, from my perspective, obscure. Um, so, I, I mean, it, it it's, it's hard to answer, but that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and probably, Chen Lai is interesting because his training is very much in Song Neo Confucianism, right. and that's where that's his identification is actually individualistic Neo Confucian Confucianism versus a political theory. Well, he's the most politist. I mean, he advises the top leaders, and yeah. he goes to the Dan Xiao, you know, to give talks. Yes. And, and he's he, very he, much committed he, to the very, system. Yeah. So yeah. Well, question. Last question, I think. Yeah. Uh, it's being discussed. There's in both individualistic tendencies of realities, uh, but in this and in, we've been seeing China, uh, this has been uh, not been discussed. So I'm very curious about uh, any of your, I think it's being mentioned by uh, Professor Yu, uh, or the, this is a return tendency. And is there possibilities for any individualistic element in, in practice to compensate uh, in the future for this, this tendency of the USA, the revival of both Marxism and the um, confusion in China? I think so you should have the last word. Yeah, I mean, if there is a real time constraint. Oh. Okay. But, but maybe you. Yeah. So, I, I, as I said in my talk, that uh, there are different ways of how to use Confucianism to support political system. So as I as I see it, Confucianism has this flexibility, then you can attach it to different kind of political system. And especially that's the story of the whole 20th century. So I think I mentioned the authoritarian tendency, particularly is associated with the kind of way of interpreting Confucianism and socialism. Uh, in line with certain kind of populism that had its deeper tradition. And then I think it's important to pay attention to this as aspect. And then, uh, and in terms of the possibility of emphasizing the indiv individualistic part, I think that is particularly associated with that group that I talk, 
of renewables. And, and then those people, I think they, they, they showed how to link uh, the Confucian ideas of learning with practice of self-governance uh, in the context of larger uh, market economy and uh, democracy. I think this, is, this group of people has been marginalized, but they're important and they exist. My one comment on that is I think that there's no consensus about what the interpretation of Confucianism and Confucius for today is or ought to be. And I think that different things have been tried out. They floated the idea of institutional Confucianism, and that was fraudulent enough as an idea that, that it didn't fly very far. But the sort of uh, uh, self-cultivation neo-Confucianism is also problematic. So I don't think we have a consent. There is a consensus there, but if it's going to emerge, it will probably emerge at the school, at universities, because that's become the way in which learning takes place in China, by and large. But yeah. last word for you, Matt. No, I mean, I agree. And nor should there be a consensus. I mean, it's such a diverse tradition and and with, and we should, and there naturally- no, There's always be. been a consensus at some point. There've been periods of right. diversity, but it ends up in some sort of consensus. Okay, but I don't think it will in the future if there's freedom of speech and people are allowed to express their views. Right. And this kind of individualism that is good part is to have a critical spirit. And, yes. and, and for that, we need more freedom of speech than we currently have in China. Thank you. Thank you.